Welcome to another episode of Roll or Die. We are bringing you the repeat guests. So we have for you another repeat guest this week. He was previously on this podcast about two years ago, episode 121, if you want to go back and listen. He is the head coach of SJAA in Sydney. He's a fourth degree black belt and he is Bruno Alves. Thanks for joining us, Bruno. Thank you, guys. Thanks to having me again. You know, like it's a pleasure always to have a chat and talk about something that we love that's jujitsu yeah yeah welcome bruno um i think straight off the top let's go to it so uh, i was at world masters um you did uh, a shitload better than i did <laughs> you were on the podium to start with um before we get into too much of the matches how was your preparation for it like i've had a look on the instagram it seemed like you really put a good camp in and you trained pretty bloody hard to get over there so tell us about your journey just to get there yeah, I think uh, I think it was something that I learned, uh, you know, even on black on the black belt, you know, as I used to go for comps and uh, you know, like uh, I haven't put that much commitment, you know, like uh, in the, my conditioning, and my like uh, nutrition, you know, like uh, and I realized that's like a, that's a huge part of your performance, you know, like and, and it's a huge part as well to to put less pressure on yourself on the day of the comp, you know, like uh, because when you you know, you work hard and you do everything, you know, perfect, you know, before the comp. The comp is the easy day, you know, like uh, it's just a few hours, you know, like it's just a few matches, you know. The hard part is you put commitment during a long period of time, you know, like, uh, and for that last word, Masters, I, I was away from competition for around six to seven years, you know, like I was just focused more. Uh, on the growth of the SGA, I was focused, you know, like uh, improve, you know, the classes that we, you know, like uh, teach our kids, adults, you know, and be away for that long was something that even, you know, like I uh, put a little bit of nervous on myself, you know, because I, I thought maybe I'll get nervous on the day, maybe I'll not perform as I performed seven years ago, and that's why. I try to do everything correct in terms of how to eat, you know, how to train, you know, like uh, how to condition my mind to like uh, go out again in a competition of high level because we know now the world masters is like, uh, you know, like uh, it's not an easy comp, you know, like uh, we know that's like uh, you have brackets of 60, 70 people. You have like a world champions and other division previous years competing, you know, like a uh, you can't go there without put a huge commitment, you know, like otherwise you just go for Vegas just for a, for a holiday, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and you had some beautiful performances. I mean, you, the in the lead into the final, I saw you, you put some submissions on in around a minute, minute's time. And then um, can you tell, talk to us about what happened in the final? I think I'm more upset about it than you, but uh, you, <laughs> you tell me your your opinion of how it went. <laughs> Yeah, the I think it was six matches, you know, like uh, the the first uh five matches I, I end up getting like a four submissions and all the submissions under like one minute thirty, you know, which it gave me a lot of confidence to the final because I was I was fresh, you know, like uh, to the finals. I even told my you know my old trained partners, you know, like uh, my gi is not even sweat, you know, like a touchy, you know. Because he asked how 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 you feeling, man? Is the final now? I said, man, I'm 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 ready to go. You know, I was standing for almost two hours there, waiting for every single fight. You know, like I didn't sit down. And I was really, you know, like in a good conditioning. But for the finals, like uh, I haven't been in the finals for seven years. So like uh, you know, sometimes people go for finals, not fighting for the submission. They you know they know like uh, it's everything on the line that for the last fight and they come with a little bit of more strategy you know like uh, they come you know play the game so i end up getting to, into his game but that wasn't a problem because uh the first you know four mi four minutes and 30 minutes i will win in the match you know like yeah. four four minutes and 30 mm -hmm. uh for the 30 last 30 seconds he end up like uh getting one advantage just to draw the match but in my mind, okay, I, I won four minutes and thirty. He draw the match thirty seconds. That's mine. No, it's not. It's not possible for three referees think about someone did more in thirty seconds that I did in four minutes and thirty. No, but 
uh, nothing to complain about my opponent. He's a, he's a, you know, like a huge mass. He won like a 12 titles in a row, you know, in the last seven, seven years. Um, I think it's like a, it's just sometimes a lot of pressure. You know, you go, you go out there with one student and you have someone that live in America and have like a lot of people outside screaming or you know, like, uh, I know, I know how, how the referee will think about, you know, like at the end to like, uh, should I lift the arm of this guy or should I lift the arm of someone that have like a uh, hundreds of people outside, you know? And I'm, I think then if I end up going to the other side and something that we just learn, you know, like uh, next time, like uh, don't let on the hands of the referee, you know, like. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. If you guys think... could see Kim's face, you would all be just disgusted. <laughs> so, so Kim's Kim's really upset about this. Tell us your uh, tell us your take on this, Kim. Well, I mean, it, I was just thinking that reminds me a lot of some advice I got early on. Um, I think I was still a white belt or blue belt. Someone said to me that a referee will really only remember the last, the first thirty seconds and the last thirty seconds of the match. Mm. So, I mean, I sort of use that myself but I've never seen it like such to such that extent used that for four minutes and 30 seconds like you said you dominated but they seem to forget entirely all of that for the last 30 seconds when the guy I mean I think he got lucky with that advantage so yeah it was it was just very disappointing for me to see that at that level that coach the the referees can still make a, a mistake like that I suppose I, I think it was a mistake that's I'm I'm not as um, humble about it as what you are Bruno I think it was a full-on mistake <laughs> sorry to say to the IBJJF it was you were robbed I think yeah, you were robbed that's, that's like yeah that's like a part, part of the game I got really upset when I finished the fight because I I knew how much work I put for that that event, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, and, you know, the way that I performed during the comp, you know, like, I was I pretty much, like, on, on my bracket, I was the one that submit more people, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. on the one minute and 30. But, yeah, I think the good things about is, like, if I had won, maybe I would not fight again, you know, like, as I lost, maybe I have to go back there. <laughs> okay. It's giving you the fuel, the hunger to go yeah. back again. To I'll, I'll train two times, you know, like uh, as I train for this one, double. Yeah. I think yeah. as competitors, that has happened in some way or another to all of us. You know, the referee uh, makes a mistake and then you get uh, or, you know, you, they give your opponent two points for something and you're like, that wasn't two points or whatever it might be. So as a competitor, um, Bruno, I think it just takes a little bit of time to deal with it. But as a coach, um, what are you going to say to your competitor, like to your um, students when that happens? Like, what would you say to your students if they got you know, robbed, as we say? Yeah, for for my students, I try to get like a lesson from everything that happened with me. You know, like I think. Uh, it's a great thing to be a competitor, you know, like that doesn't mean if you're not competitive, you cannot be a great coach, you know, like we have full example of like people that like, uh, they never be a competitor, but they are great coaches, you know, like, and they can build, you know, like a, a lot of champions, you know, like, uh, and in the same way, if you can translate and be a great competitor and great coach, you are, you are far ahead because you experience all those little things that you can pass for your students, you know, like, uh, in terms of a lesson for my students, uh, you know, like uh, I believe, like uh, I, I learned a lot of lessons from that fight. You know, like uh, a lot of lessons about like uh, to be more updated with the the rules. You know, like uh, to you know, like uh, watch out the finals in a different way. You know, like uh, sometimes you can't go in the same way that you go for the you know the the preliminary fights that you fight with not not the same level. You know, finals and same final usually. You know the tough people they out there. You know, like uh, and some people, uh, they will fight different. You know, like uh, they want to put the game first. So like uh, and also learn the last thirty seconds of the fight, as Kim mentioned, the first thirty seconds of the fight. Not only the referee, you know, like I uh, will remember, but also it's really important for you set up your game at the beginning of the fight, and to not lose the match at the end of the fight because you didn't get the grips that you want or maybe you should act in a different way. For myself, when I saw the fight again, I said, why, why did I pull guard? I just had, I could just double grip his collar and 
come on, pull God yourself. You're not sweep me in 30 in 20, 30 seconds, you know, like uh, but you see how how crazy it is because I saw my my friend Otavio Souza screaming like a pull God quickly. And then those like a five seconds I I thought about I should follow him because if I don't follow him, I'll regret after. You know, you see how crazy it is. In five seconds, you think about someone screaming, what can happen later if you don't do what's what your coach is screaming. You know? like, uh, yeah. But uh, it's just lessons that we can carry on and pass, pass for our students. You know, But the mo most important lesson from that comp was hard work, you know, like uh, before, you know, a camp, is what it give you the results, you know, like if you work hard around the camp, the competition is the, is the easy part, you know, like if you don't work hard on the camp, you're going to have a hard time, you know, at the competition. You know? Yeah. And look, as you just said, you know, with, when there are 60 or 70 people in a bracket um, at World Masters, like a silver medal, Bruno, is still phenomenal, mate. That's still an amazing performance. And to get, you know, four submissions and generally all under a minute and a half, that it really just shows the work that you put in, mate. So, you know, seriously, congratulations on it. It's very, very impressive, mate. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate, you know, like, I, I appreciate because uh, I think, like, the, the Australian Jiu Jitsu is going on the right direction. You know, we, we see so much good things happening here, you know, like, for myself that I'm being here for 13 years, you know, like, uh, I feel that I'm part of, of that success, you know, like, I maybe help with, like, a, one percent you know like uh but uh i think with the work of everyone you know, like uh just good things can come our way you know it's great to see like people you know see me fighting over there you know people from america say oh are you in australia i remember you you know like a lot of tough people come out there you know like i want to come to this visit you know like you have a lot of superstars with the no get seen now you know like uh it's something that make me proud you know like i'm i'm from brazil but like i have a lot of love for the country that i live you know and you said that it was seven or eight years since you last competed so you actually won the world masters in 2016 was that the last time that you you competed the uh, ibjjf world masters i i fought um I won three times you know like i yeah. closed the brackets one time with my teammates you know like mm -hmm. i won three times and the last time I, I lost the finals again to Clark Grace, you know, like seven years ago. <laughs> yeah. Probably uh -huh. free, de free decision again. What? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and you've also won, just for our listeners who may not know, I'm, I'll just read this off uh, BJJ Heroes. So you've also won uh, the Abu Dhabi Pro Masters won in 2016 and 2017, IBJJF South American champion in 2010, um, you're the Bowler 8, Super 8 champion, uh, you've won at Coloured Belt, you won Worlds in 20, 2008 as a Brown Belt, European in 2006 as, and seven as a Purple Belt, um, you've been the runner-up at Pan Ams as a Brown Belt in 2009, wow. so you're, yeah, very, very accomplished competitor as well, just in case any of our listeners or viewers are not aware of your name and, mm -hmm. and what you've done for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in general. Like you're you're definitely very, very accomplished. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I I I've, I've been doing Jiu Jitsu for like uh you know like a long long time. Um I started with judo, you know, when I was really young, you know, like uh three, four years old. And I transitioned from Jiu Jitsu like uh, when I was thirteen years old and since then you know, I've been training, competing, you know, like, uh, that's why I feel comfortable, you know, like, I took a break of five, six years from jiu-jitsu, which I could have done, gone in a different way and accomplished even more things, but, you know, that's, that's part of a life. I don't, I don't regret, you know, uh, take that break from jiu-jitsu because I could not be here today if all the, those things would not connect on the right way, you know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, it's been a, it's been a great journey. Like it's great to see my students as well. You know, like uh, you know, doing well as well. I think that's the that's the second part of the you know the journey when you kind of like uh slow down to compete and your students like follow your patch. You know, like uh, I think it's great. It's more it's even more accomplishment when you see you know the results. You know. Yeah, at at some stage later on, Bruno, I really want to talk to you about your kids' classes because your kids' classes seem um, very popular and they seem like a lot of fun but your 
uh, your journey into jujitsu. How did that happen? Did you have family members? Did you have friends? Was there a jujitsu gym that was close? Like, how did you uh, get started in jujitsu? Uh, back in the days in Brazil, it was really hard to find uh, jujitsu for kids, you know, like, uh, that's why I started with judo, you know, like, uh, jujitsu wasn't that popular. And, you know, like, we was really well known, like, as a sport that people would fight on the streets, you know, like, a lot of parents, they had that, like, uh, no, you, you don't want to do jiu-jitsu, you know, look what's happened with people that train jiu-jitsu. But uh, I started through a friend of mine, you know, like, uh, he used to live in front of a jiu-jitsu school in our city. And, you know, he invited one day to come over, you know, and since then, when I came for the first class, I just, I just fall in love with the sport, you know, like, uh, uh I saw like, uh, you know, how much, you know, like uh, jiu-jitsu was good for self-defense, you know, how much, you know, people was helping doing jiu-jitsu, you know, and that's was something that like, uh, you know, since 13 years old, uh, I want for myself, you know. Back in the days, our club was, you know, not in Rio, not in Sao Paulo, which is the, you know, like uh, the mecca for jiu-jitsu back in the days in Brazil. We was kind of in Queensland, you know, if you compare with Australia. And it was really hard for us to see the end of the tunnel because like we never we never had any results on the IBJJF. You know, even as even single medal, we never had a medal. But after my coach started putting, you know, like a lot of energy on the train, you know, my, my coach is at uh a lot of things start happening over there, you know, and people start winning the awards, the Brasileiros, and then like uh, you know. We had many world champions coming from that gym, you know, like Otavio Souza, the Stima Brothers, you know, myself and many others came from the same club. You know, like I think it was the best generation created there. And from there, everyone went around the world, you know, those guys living in California, Europe, you know, like uh, that's that's that was the best generation that we had inside of my school, you know. Can you tell us a bit about training with those guys? What was that like coming up? I was it was a kind of war, you know, like uh, it was really, really hard, you know. Like we, I remember our training would be ten a.m. in Brazil, and our city is like a uh, thirty, thirty, thirty-five, thirty-nine every single day, you know, like uh, no air conditioning, you know. We used to train for two hours, you know, straight, go home, rest go for a gym to work out, back to train for two more hours, you know, like, and so on, train nighttime sometimes. Uh, I think it was really good for me to, like, uh, you know, build my base, you know, like, I think to take seven years away from a comp and go out there and perform us again is do a mm-hmm. base that you built, you know, like, and something that's like, uh, you know, uh, that's why I talk with my students too, like, okay, it's good you learn, you know, so advanced techniques, it's good you learn, like, uh, the new game, it's good you learn to, you know, like, uh, do those things, but, like, uh, build a strong base, you know, with a strong base, the time will pass, and you see, like, uh, wow, this this guy's tough, he's 40, 50, he's 60, but, like, uh, wow, that's that's a really tough guy, he, he knows jiu-jitsu, you know, that's, like, a doesn't matter your flexibility, doesn't matter your, your cardio, you'll be able to perform because you build a solid base, and I'm, like, a you know, lucky enough to had build that strong base. That's something that make me comfortable. You know, like uh, to train, to compete. You know, like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. There's a there's a book and it's called The Talent Code um, by a guy called Daniel Coyle. And I think I think everybody should read it. It's a phenomenal book. It's um, he talks a lot about skill acquisition and how to learn, you know, correctly and those sorts of things. But one of the things he talks about in the book is uh, how all of a sudden uh, in Puerto Rico, all of these uh, kids playing baseball started to become really, really good. And then for you, Bruno, coming up in this gym where they hadn't had any champions and then all of a sudden they're just producing a whole bunch of world champions, it's quite often how those sorts of things happen, right? Um, you know, that saying of iron sharpens iron and those sorts of sayings. But I think there's definitely something to that when you're competing in the gym against these guys day in, day out. And as you say, you know, it's hot, you're suffering, um, you're going back every day. There's definitely something to be said for going through those tough times. And then when you are 
heading out to a competition, um, quite often, as you say, like the competition can be a little bit easier than the roles that you're getting on your mats in your gym, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing that changed my mind as well was like when I went to England and I lived there for three, four months with with Braulio Stima and all like that. And I had the experience to be with someone that just had won the DCC, you know, like a category of open weight since and see how much that guy trained, I'm, I realized that, like, wow, I actually don't train enough, you know? And that has a black yeah. belt, you know? Like, I, you see, like, wow. a, someone, like, pushing the limits beyond the limits, and you say, wow. And he's still running the bees and still doing a lot of things. That that was kind of an open mind to myself. I think that was the transition when I was black belt, I'm, and I went back to Brazil, and everything changed, you know? Everything just click i start to have great results i start to beat beat guys that's like a, a lot of tough guys and i said wow well, you know like i just need to like a train as these guys train you know because sometimes it's like i would think we train a lot but like we don't you know because someone like uh around across the world is training double than us is trained on the right way he's rest on the and like when they have to you know i think that's that's really important uh and realize as well your level of jiu-jitsu, you know, like I know what I, I, I know where I am, you know, I know, you know, people that are above me, you know, and have that experience to train with a Braulio, with like a Homo Bajal, you know, competing with Marcelo Garcia, all those guys, you, you see where you are, you know, like you, you can't, jiu-jitsu can't lie, you know, like yeah. uh, in a training, in a competition, you're going to see those levels, you're going to see those layers, and it's up to you to like uh, raise yourself for the next layer, you know, like a, uh, and be the best the best version that you can be you know like uh you you want to be on the stars you know like i uh, try work harder to get there maybe you'll not get there you're gonna get closer but like uh that closer can give you a lot of things you know and um bruno you you compete in the lightweight division but you've also you medium, have a go at the a uh, medium, medium so yeah. you but you also have a go in the absolute division yeah how do you yeah. find that as a as a sort of midi, smaller to medium person going in the, the absolute division through your through your career, uh, I always like I always like try train with heavy guys, you know, like uh, was something that my game, the, all those omoplatas, those stuff, you know, like you don't feel the weight, you know, when you, when you lock someone's shoulder, you know, like with your legs, yeah. And by train with heavy guys in my city, you know, like was something that uh. I remember I always would do the open class, you know, for my purples or my browns, you know, was and was even worse because the open weights would be before. <laughs> now they do after, it's great, you know, like yeah. you just like uh, finish your category, okay? But before we would do the for Brazilians, for the worst, the the open weights before, wow. and I always had a, a lot of fun because I, I never had like a that much obligation to win or not much pressure, you know, like a and it's something that's like a, I think. You you truly show how beautiful your jiu-jitsu is when you're like smaller and you fight with someone bigger and you go out there and submit and like uh you know like get someone's back or or you know like a sweep because like uh, there are a lot of different weight and strength over there you know like and to polish your jiu-jitsu you should be able to fight with someone that's heavy and stronger than you you know like uh I remember the best experience I had was when I purple I fought the the open weights. Uh, of the Europeans and was maybe seven matches on the day, you know. And back in the back in the days, Europeans we had a lot of people coming up from Finland, you know, like uh, from you know Norway. And I fought with a lot of heavy guys. I had like a uh, seven matches. I win like around like a uh, four, you know, like three to four by submission, and end up winning the open class as a as a purple belt lightweight, you know. And then that was something that's like a uh, showed me well, you know, like a uh, we should work on our jiu-jitsu to be able to fight with, with anyone, even if they are heavier, you know, like uh, we should be able to find a different game, you know, different leverage to sweep someone or find ways to like get submissions, you know. So on that, Bruno, um, I've competed, so I'm middleweight, I compete sometimes against uh, some big men <laughs> in the open weight category. Um, one of my awesome friends, Theo, uh, shout out to you, brother. <laughs> he edits this podcast, so he might edit that. Uh, that yeah. friend. <laughs> um, does your game plan change at all if you're coming up against someone you know 
decisively bigger than you or do you sort of stick to your a game and um funnel them into that yeah i, I try playing my game but one thing that i i try to be more aware is like uh to to not let allow someone like a uh, get closer to me you know i don't mean like a uh, getting a uh, side control half guard or right on top but whenever they are getting like a uh, one step closer to get that position I'm, I kind of let it go of my grips and like uh, create always a space because I can't I can't let the weight go over me and I start to push, you know, because that's when you get tired. That's when it's like uh, you let it go your grips and they start getting close to you, you know. Like my goal always when I'm fight with someone heavier is like uh, understand that when those spots are happening, I have to like uh, if I'm playing spider guard and I see they come in close, you know, like sometimes I'll let it go the spider guard, create the space again and get my grips back, you know, because when you start to push someone heavier, you know, like you're just going to get tired. You know? Be on bottom is already hard and be on bottom if someone dropping their weight against you is like is even worse. So like uh, something that I advise my students is always like uh, don't let someone get closer. Find a guy that you don't feel the weight of someone, you know, like some guys you you put a last and someone like uh, just drive their weight, you're going to get tired. You know, like uh, yeah. I like to play, for example, spider when some when someone is really heavy. I keep the distance and keep the the weight away from me. You know, like arm drags are really good because, you know, usually people move slowly and then you can come around and go to the back. You know, there are a few things that you can't, for the triangles, you can't go for a triangle in a heavy guy. You know, as soon as you lock the triangle, they just come across and squash, you know, and... You can't do those things. You realize, okay, I will skip those kind of techniques, keep the distance away from me, and try more positions that like uh, omoplatas, you know, like a back position. Those are positions that you're going to have more success when someone is heavy. Yeah. Right, that's awesome advice. Thank you. And um, Bruno, speaking of you as a, as a coach, tell us about SJAA and, you know, how it came about and what's been happening. We last spoke with you about two years ago. Has, has there been any... Any updates, any changes since we last spoke? Uh, I think so. Two years ago, we just coming out from COVID. You know, I think yeah. it was uh, such a hard time for many school owners, you know, many people that live from Jiu-Jitsu, you know. Uh, I think it was the worst time that we could experience in terms of, like, uh, you know, rebuild a gene. Uh, but we had a lot of support from our community. But a lot of things happened on those, you know, like uh, two years. We, we have more locations, you know, like we... Uh, I think we didn't have any locations in Queensland or, or we start in 2022. Now we have like five locations in Queensland. Uh, we came from like a f 13 schools. Now we are with like a 20 schools around Australia. Wow. And also like uh, we really focus on, you know, teach kids, uh, you know, like uh, that's our that's our main goal because uh I think everyone is working towards the growth of jiu-jitsu, you know, like you guys, like, uh, you know, doing an awesome job, you know, like I think podcasts, uh, everyone that sell DVDs, instruction, they're doing like a great job to promote jiu-jitsu. Uh, but what I believe is like uh, to jiu-jitsu grow, we need more people training jiu-jitsu. So schools are probably the most important part of that, you know, that puzzle, you know, like it's more people training, more visibility, more DVDs will be sold, more people will get paid to be a professional athlete, you know, like I so work with the young, youngest ones, which is the kids, you know, that will give you a better future for our sport, you know, so that's our focus, you know, we've been teaching, uh, you know, like a thousands of kids, our program starts with kids to two and a half, you know, like all the way to teenagers. Uh, most of our schools are like, uh, of course, we have adults, we have high level Jiu Jitsu inside of our clubs as well. But if we put in numbers, I think like a 75% of our program is with kids, you know, like uh, that's why we put a lot of work. We, we became a specialist and like uh, teach kids. We try, you know, give the best experience for them, for the parents, and also uh, be beyond, beyond to be only a sport, you know, because uh, when you just. Mm my sport you are competing with any other sport you know like we try you know like a show how how jiu-jitsu is important for the development of the kids in terms of like confidence discipline anti-bullying you know like uh, that's why we put a a lot of effort to 
not only talk, but also show and also like a demonstrate into our classes, all those, you know, like a values that we believe in. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I've seen uh, when I go down and I watch kids training or um, I've met kids who are now, you know, training as teenagers and moving into the adult class. When they've been training for quite a long time, you almost see these people or these kids coming through as different. Like they've got a different way about them. Their levels of respect are, are, you know, quite often a lot stronger. Their levels of self-discipline are a lot stronger. They um, they seem more confident in the people in the person that they are. So I think that speaks to what you're talking about, Bruno, in regards to the kids' class, right? Like you're not just teaching jujitsu. Like there's a lot of lessons through jujitsu that you start to teach kids. Yeah, I think uh, you know, as a month, someone that starts, you know, judo if four years old and be, you know, like a. I try to put myself as a kid every time I'm trying to like uh, build a program or or work with my coaches, you know, like uh, what's the experience that I had when I was little that I I didn't feel comfortable, you know, what's the experience and, you know, what's the, you know, like uh, the values that I learned, you know, since a young person trained jiu-jitsu that, you know, turned who I am today. And that's really important. You know, like it's same thing for for a beginners class. If we talk about about adults, you know, like uh, you you can't teach a class and not put yourself as a beginner. You know? Like I, I put as a lesson or a test for anyone of like a, anyone that have a school. Like a, try put a white belt and get into a beginners class and like uh, you know see everything that's happened. See if it's like a if it's nice to come for a gym and you never learn a break fall and get someone through you like 10 times and that's your first class, you know, that's that's not something that like uh, we think about. But when we start putting ourselves on the shoes of like someone that never trained martial arts, someone that didn't have a background in sports and they want to get into jiu-jitsu, we, we have to make sure like we understand how that person feels and how can we improve, you know, that experience? Because if if one person have a bad experience with jiu-jitsu, like a, a family, you know, like a, a, f- a lot of friends of that person who hear about that bad, bad experience, yeah. and that's that's bad for our sport. But if someone spread the word of jiu-jitsu and like, oh, I live in Melbourne, my my son training back in Sydney, you know, like uh, maybe we start in Melbourne and they will find a school, a great school, they start training. You know, like I think if we spread, you know, like if we improve as a uh, school owner, as coaches, as someone that, you know, spread the word about the jiu-jitsu, you know, like this part will just go, grow and grow. And, and it's growing a lot. We can clearly see like how much the sport's growing around the world, and especially here in Australia, you know. On that, Bruno, there's a, sorry, Kim. On on yeah. that, um, there's a there's a guy called Jocko Willink, who a lot of people would uh, would know who Jocko is. Um, Ex Navy Seal, all those sorts of things. Very good podcast, uh, and he's an author. He's written quite a few books, and one of the books that he's written is called The Way of the Warrior Kid, and that mo- that book is actually going to be turned into a movie. It's in production at the moment, and I think that 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 movie when it comes out it's got chris pratt so a lot of people would know him from i think he's done the marvel movies and that sort of thing i think this movie because it's all based around jiu-jitsu and learning and you know that you've got to put work into into learning something you know you don't wake up one day and know your times table and you don't wake up one day and and know jiu-jitsu you've got to actually put work and effort into these sorts of things so when this movie comes out, I think there's going to be another explosion of kids wanting to do jiu-jitsu. The same thing that happened in the 80s when the like when Karate Kid came out, everybody, including me, wanted to do karate um, because you saw, you know, this movie and what the benefits could be. And, and you know, if you were being bullied, maybe you could look after yourself. And I think there's going to be another massive explosion of jiu-jitsu when this movie comes out. So... Um, you might need more kids' classes, mate, coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but uh, it's something that I, 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 know, I know that. I know, like, uh, the, 
the wages up, you know, like if you see the, for example, if you put the percentage of like how how much people train in jiu-jitsu, you know, like uh, I think it's yeah. 99.9, .9, they don't train jiu-jitsu. Maybe the 0 0.01, they train jiu-jitsu. So like uh, it's our work of, you know, everyone, like a, Craig this, did amazing work with the CGI. That was amazing. That's like a, so much views, like so much podcast that we never will be in a podcast like this and talking about jiu-jitsu and how many people got interesting about jiu-jitsu. And then like a movies like this one, I think they, they said that I want coming up from Rickson on the Netflix. They uh, want to record his history. That's just like, wow. It's just like we... We are just on the beginning. It was nice to see the word mass and say, I haven't been there for seven years. It was just like, wow, that's that's crazy. Like a 34 areas of jiu-jitsu plus uh, three comps at the same time, a lot of like stores, you know, people. Who, that was crazy, you know. It's just like uh, un unreal. If someone would tell, tell me like a uh, jiu-jitsu would be like this and, you know, like a, uh, Ten years ago, we would say, "No, nah, you crazy," but actually, it's just the beginning, you know. Like, and it's exciting for us to be involved with something that you know, like us, we love. It's something that transforms people because uh, I can clearly say that, like, uh, it's not, it's not bullshit. It's not it's like uh, I, I see kids coming up, like, uh, and they become some, someone like a chess up, and you know, yeah. in our jiu-jitsu, we have a program that we take kids to be. In all programs, they go for three to five, seven to eight, and then grow up, and then they they become a leaders. You know, we start bringing them to participate and be trained, then to become coaches, and then like uh, they go become coaches, and they have the chance to start to work to the academy, make money because like uh, every single person, you know, like a thirteen, twelve, they are making a little bit of cash, cash working for jujitsu. And then if they want to take the decision to be a black belt and be a head coach or school owner, they can be if they want, or they can, you know, follow the patch in a different career that they want. So like, uh, that, that's our, our goal, you know, just like spread the sport as much as possible and show the, the good things that we have in our sport and clean up the bad things that we have. Yeah, I think that's um, that's probably a really nice place to to end it, to wind it up. Do you have any final words, any words of wisdom for our listeners, Bruno? About did you say? Uh, just I uh, want to say thanks for you guys. You know, like I think that's really important for the sport. You know, like I I hear a lot of podcasts back in Brazil. You know, like we have like a many of podcasts with Jiu Jitsu. You know, like a. I'm really happy with the guys are doing and like hopefully we have more and more podcasts because that's the way that you we know people from our community that's the way that we you know we know our roots as well it's really important like uh, I can't I can't be here and forget about people that came here you know way before me you know like uh, I can't forget about all those masters and people that train jiu-jitsu or teach jiu-jitsu for nothing you know now we have a uh, a business now we have a you know a sport that bringing money for a lot of people but like back in the days a lot of people put a lot of sweat for yeah. for nothing you know so like uh you know projects like you guys are doing i made for this sport you know like uh i just want to say thanks to to have me again and hopefully you know like a few words you know can inspire a few people can you know open their mind to think in a different way or you know like uh train harder for the next comp or don't let on the referee side when the when the match finish, you know, like I think is whatever people take in a positive way for, you know, our podcast here will be great for like a one, two, ten or hundreds of people. You know? For sure. For sure. Brentos, did you yeah. want to do the wrap up? Yeah, sure. I, Bruno, I, I just want to say thank you. I think you spoke to um, a lot of things on this podcast really well and it seems like you're, it's not just your jiu-jitsu that you care about. It's the growth of jiu-jitsu. It's the development of people, the development of kids. So those are the positive things that um, as somebody who you know, loves jiu-jitsu but likes seeing people be successful, I think those are the things that are super important, mate. So 
um, congratulations on that and, and continue down that path. I think it's, that's where we want to be, right? Just continue to grow it and make it a positive experience for as many people as we can. You know, we talk about jujitsu is not for everybody, but it kind of is in some ways too, you know, like we can all try it. And I think one of the things with jujitsu is if you put time and effort into it, it really can be for anyone. I, I, I feel, you know, however that looks for you, maybe it's just once or twice a week um, where you're not being competitive and you're just looking at like a fun hobby where you're amongst friends and maybe you're overcoming some sort of phobia or maybe you're overcoming something that you struggle with, you know, like I don't like people touching me. So, you know what, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to do jujitsu. So I think what you're doing, Bruno, and the way that you're talking about these sorts of things, it's a credit to you, mate. And obviously, um, SJJA is going to just continue to grow. So well done to that too. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I agree 100%. You know, like uh, we we are here to make a difference on, in people's life, you know, like uh, and, you know, not just me, but I have... Uh, I have hundreds, I could list hundreds of names of like schools or clubs that are doing uh, excellent work. You know, I, I, I follow yep. everybody. I try like, a, you know, get inspired by, you know, like a, some actions of like a, people are doing, you know, like interstates and, you know, it's great. It's great to see like a, we have a female, like, a, you know, open weights and, you know, like a category ADCC champion, you know, like a, when yeah. would think about would have like a you know like a, such a high level inside of uh that country you know like and it's not be it's not it's not that long that's like uh you know things just switch you know like uh now you know you guys are export you know you guys are doing like a seminars around the world and like uh, that's that's just amazing you know amazing to see amazed to you know be here for 13 years and just watch the movement you know like and see you know things going on the right direction you know? like uh, again congratulations guys keep the great work and i'm i'm fond of your work as well you know thank, thank you. you bruno thank um you. so on behalf of kim and anton's put a lot of work into this podcast previously too so um he takes some of the credit for building this up as well so appreciate that um but that's it guys we'll finish it there uh thank you for tuning into another episode of roll or die we spoke about this really briefly last week but we always sit there and say like, rate, and share the podcast, uh, and we appreciate when you do that. But like, rate, and share other people's um, jiu-jitsu schools that you've trained at. So if you go somewhere and you train at somebody's schools or you're in Sydney and you go and train with Bruno, um, leave a positive review. You know, like these sorts of things, the Google five-star reviews, they help businesses, um, they help gyms to continue to grow, to continue to get people in. So, you know, take a minute and do those sorts of things. Um, and probably just as importantly, uh, leave the Roll or Die podcast five stars wherever you can. Uh, tell your friends, share it wide. Uh, Bruno, again, thank you, mate. It was really good getting to know you a little bit. Uh, Kim, you're a superstar as always. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it.